Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harris and I am president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I'm delighted to welcome today's panelists and thank them for joining us on very short notice. We plan to host the Ambassador to Malta, the Honorable Gina Abercrombie Winstanley, but due to the 16-day shutdown of the federal government, the Ambassador was unable to travel. In its 101 years as a free speech forum, continuous years as a free speech forum, the City Club has learned the importance of versatility. In being versatile, the City Club aspires to be timely and thought-provoking as well. So true to those aspirations, we are joined today by a panel of individuals who have, will have well-informed perspectives on the government shutdown, the forces that created it, and the votes that finally ended it. We've heard many reports on the shutdown's impact, patients unable to receive medical treatment, the closing of national parks, the closing of Head Start programs, and a halt to scientific research, among other impacts. According to Standard & Poor's, the shutdown has cost the U.S. economy $24 billion. The shutdown has impacted foreign perceptions of the U.S. in tangible and intangible ways that experts are only now beginning to assess. An October 7 CNBC online story captioned, China and Japan warn U.S. on default, reported that China's vice finance minister, quote, told a media briefing that China has made clear its unease over the political impasse in Washington. In Japan, the Ministry of Finance is very worried about the potential impact on currency markets, according to a senior official. A U.S. default could cause investors to dump the U.S. dollar, which would sharply push up the value of the yen. End quote. And although the government has now reopened and the debt ceiling been lifted, the deal was a temporary fix and the specter exists that we will go through this all again early next year. So with that backdrop, we are pleased to have our panelists assess what, if anything, our nation has learned as a result of this episode and what happens next. Moderating our panel today is Henry Gomez, chief political reporter for the Northeast Ohio Media Group. He is joined on stage by former U.S. Representative and current leader of McDonald Hopkins Government Strategies, Steve LaTourette, and by University of Akron Political Science Professor and Fellow at the Ray C. Bliss Institute of Applied Politics, David Cohen. Joining us via Google Hangout is NPR Washington, D.C. correspondent Tamara Keith. I will now turn today's program over to our moderator, Mr. Gomez. Right. Uh, thank you, Paul. It's going to be a fun conversation, hoping you guys can help us make sense out of what's been a very confusing and chaotic couple of weeks. So why don't we get started? Um, so at least for now, the United States won't go over a fiscal cliff. And I think the best place to start this conversation is what did we learn and what did our congressional leaders learn uh, during the 16-day stalemate? Uh, why don't we start with you, uh, Tamara, since you've been covering this uh, from Washington. Uh, well, uh the minority leader of the Senate the other day said there's no there's no education in the second kick of a mule uh, and I think that <laughs> possibly maybe um, our, our leaders have learned one hopes that um, shutting down the government isn't exactly the best way to run a government um, I, I think that, that it certainly um, was a tough lesson uh, and and we'll see if it is a lesson that really has kicked in but uh, I, I think that that's what that's what at least quite a few members I've spoken to say they got out of it. Congressman LaTourette, uh, you left Congress, and when you did, you, you cited your frustration with the partisan gridlock there. What's it been like for you watching from the outside looking in over the last few weeks? Well, I, I was just in the House yesterday doing a tour of some uh, middle school students from Dublin, Ohio, to fill in for Congressman T. Barry and Stivers because <laughs> they wanted to go home. And I remarked to the staff that I, I, as I look at this, I don't think I was the problem for 18 years that, uh, <laughs> in terms of what was going on there. Uh, it, it is, uh, it's an acceleration of the things that sort of led me out the door in the, you know, we, we have these wave elections, 2006, 2008, 2010, and every time you have a wave election, you get <clears throat> what I affectionately refer to as accidental members of Congress. Uh, and people, and on both sides, I'm not picking on anybody, and, and people who come in who really don't know what it is to be a legislator. Uh, and, uh, you know, take, let's say that you were a senator from Texas, for instance. And <laughs> not naming any names. No, I, no I'm not. And, but, but you, 
you, there's, a, there's a way to get things done. And if you, you know, I, I commend anybody that has truly held beliefs and everything else. But if you launch a plan, there should be an expectation you can at least execute the plan and get a result that's palatable. That, that's completely not going on now. You have people who, whose main function was to come and vote no on stuff. And we saw that 144 House Republicans voted no on the deal that ended the, the shutdown. And can, can I just say also, I think we have people um, that are interested in their cult of celebrity. I mean, we're in the 21st uh, century, we have social media, and you know, potentially uh, a young senator from Texas uh, may fall in love with the camera, and, and instead of, like it used to be, in which they had to serve an apprenticeship, uh, instead they try to make a name for themselves and set themselves up for a presidential run. Well, you know, that, that's a great point. You know, it used to be a sort of an unwritten tradition in the Senate that if you were a new senator, you didn't speak for like the first year. Mm -hmm. You know, you sort of hung out and watched and learned the ropes and so forth and so on. And now the shortest distance between a television camera and, uh, and a senator is, uh, that's the shortest distance in Washington. Mm -hmm. They get right up there. <laughs> also a dangerous place to be between. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> well, well, since... Since you brought it up, Congressman, does Senator Ted Cruz, is, is he a winner in this? Is he a loser in this? Uh, what, what's the, what's the long-term long, long prognosis for, for Ted Cruz? Well, I, I think one of the strange things about this, if, if you uh, believe uh, public opinion surveys, and I do except for all the polls produced by PPP, but okay. other than that, uh, he actually, his popularity soared uh, amongst the people that he's attempting to communicate with which are the, uh, the very uh, conservative members of the Republican Party. So they think he fought the good fight. Uh, the rest of us are rhinos and squishes and, and, and uh, queaslings and facilitators and so forth and so on. Uh, but he certainly didn't do the party uh, any favors. Uh, and although the, it's sort of a mixed message, I don't think anybody's smelling like a rose coming out of this thing. The president got dinged, Democrats got dinged. But the lion's share of the blame went to the Republicans. And he is uh, uh, largely uh, responsible for that. It's not just the not just the Ted Cruz's of the world. It's also the Louis Gohmert's, the, uh, the Yolos, and in, in, in the House. And and um, I think uh, I think for them in their districts, they're they're probably uh, getting a lot of pats on the back. Well, they are. There was, there was a great Washington Post story uh, about Ted Yoho, and he's a. If you're not familiar with Ted Yoho. It's not the chocolate drink. He's a congressman from, 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 from uh, Florida. He was a veterinarian, and if you go in his office, apparently he has pictures of his old patients on the wall, all these cows. <laughs> and, and he was very proud of the fact, and he was one of the folks saying that, you know what, I don't think default on our, our obligations is going to be such a bad thing. And his response from his district was overwhelmingly positive. He was getting a lot of attaboys, and you go get them, and you know, that's why we sent you there, and so forth and so on. So, so while we can, you know, sort of poke fun at uh, some of these people, they, you, they are, uh, some of them, some of them are crazy, but some of them are the byproduct of the districts that they come from. And they are doing, they're executing what the people that they represent have asked them to do. What role do you think that uh, redistricting and, and gerrymandering plays in this? I mean, we have districts that are, are drawn to reflect a certain type of constituency that will re-elect incumbents over and over again, and not just at the national level, but at the state level. How, how is that playing into what we're seeing in Washington? And do you see any uh, possibility of an effort for redistricting reform? Um, I, I think uh, anybody who knows me knows I've been talking about this for a couple of years now. Uh, gerrymandering, I think, is uh, one of the major reasons we're in the mess we are right now. I think it's one of the reasons that Congress is so dysfunctional. And I think it's a real threat to our democracy. Now, we've always had gerrymandering. Gerrymandering has been around since the very beginning. But I think the extreme gerrymander that we saw after uh, the 2010 census uh, that resulted in a state like Ohio, which is roughly a 50-50 state that Obama carried twice, we have 16 seats here. 12 of them are uh, safe Republican seats, and four of them are even safer Democratic seats. You know, and that, that is a, a significant imbalance. And the fact that we have uh, fewer and fewer swing districts ac around the country means that less of these folks in the House of Representatives are worried about a general election 
challenge, and they're more worried about uh, a primary challenge. And so they have to uh, make sure that they go to the extremes in order to, to fend off uh, any kind of potential primary challenge. And I think it's one of the reasons why um, we have less of a, an environment in which uh, these people are willing to compromise and bargain. And um, unless we fix it, um, I, I think we're in serious trouble as a country, politically. You know, everybody likes to pick on Ohio, but uh, just to be fair, if you look at Illinois, which had a redistricting exactly. as well, so they took the city of Chicago, which is uh, overwhelmingly democratic, and turned it into the, the hub of a bicycle wheel with these rays of sunshine spokes coming out, and they wiped out five incumbent Republicans mm -hmm. in, in that process. And so it's the mirror image uh, of, of what happened in Ohio, and, the, you know, it's really who has the pen, and, and I, I don't think either party uh, has really done this well from a bipartisan standpoint, but if you think about it, they're political parties. I mean, <laughs> they're in the business of making sure that their folks win. So I guess they're doing what's to be expected. Uh, but I do think we have to get, you know, if you look at the ballot initiative we had in Ohio, that, that was just written by the Ohio Democratic Party and organized labor. And so that was not a, that was not an honest attempt, in my opinion, to fix the problem. But there has to be a computer system someplace, somewhere, that can draw compact, competitive districts so people act who actually are running for office have to address the issues rather than hewing to one side or another. And uh, last thing, I mean, where we sit now, Marsha Fudge's district, the old Lou Stokes district, Stephanie Tubbs Jones district, after redistricting, it's, it's what's called a D plus 36. That means that Mrs. Fudge, good friend of mine, can stay in bed on election day and she's guaranteed 86% of the vote as a base vote that really doesn't give her a lot of motivation to find the Republican point of view uh, in her district. And there are Republican districts the same all over the country. And, and so, you know, David's exactly right. Uh, people really don't sweat November anymore if you're in the House of Representatives. Uh, what they sweat is the primary. And if you're a Republican, you, you fear a Tea Party person on your right. And if you're a Democrat, you fear a, a moveon.org or a progressive Democrat uh, on your left. I just want to toss in a little something that maybe is a ray of hope, though uh, I don't want to put too much credit to it, but in California they actually did a couple of things recently that shaked things up. They, uh, they created a nonpartisan uh, redistricting commission. They took it out of the hands of the parties. And the way those lines were drawn most recently have, have led to, uh, in combination with another change, uh, I think a little bit of moderation out of parts of California. The other thing they did, which um, is fascinating, is they created a different type of primary system. It's a top two primary system. And so the incentive has become, uh, it, it actually favors moderation because two Democrats or two Republicans could make it out of the primary. And so the, you end up with people who are trying to appeal to folks from the other party or, or independents to get a, a majority or a, enough votes to, to get out of the primary. And I don't know if this is exactly why this happened, but Congressman Devin Nunes, who um, is a Republican from California Central Valley, who we didn't really hear from that much until all of a sudden the middle of this crisis, and he was actually very critical of the more hardline uh, Republicans. I think he um, maybe replaced Congressman LaTourette in coming up with a great name for them, uh, calling them lemmings. And I think in, right. in some ways, Congressman LaTourette, of course, called them chuckleheads last year, which uh, <laughs> a fine moment in, in <laughs> legislative language. But, <laughs> but, but I think that, that um, Devin Nunes, in some ways, feels safe saying those kinds of things because his bigger concern is not someone from the right necessarily, but someone more moderate. That's a great point. I just, on Devin Nunez had a better line than I ever had when the government reopened. He said, well, it looks like the Star Wars convention has left town. So that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, Congressman, um, Maybe a little historical perspective from you. You came, you came up during the Gingrich Revolution in the 90s, in 90, 1994, and the budget shutdown of 1995 and 1996. Um, 
how does this recent one compare with the previous one? What are some of the, do, do you see a lot of differences? And, and can you walk us through a little bit of the, how the dynamics have changed? Yeah, you know, a couple of things. One, one is there were 73 uh, new Republicans in the 1994 election, that, that tidal wave election. And there's some people that I recognize in the audience that were probably at some of my early debates and they thought we were crazy, you know. And so uh, I, we didn't have anything on this new bunch. Uh, I would say that, first of all. Second of all, that 95, 96 was about numbers uh, uh, and not ideology. If you remember, it's the first time since 1954 that the Republicans became the majority party and both sides were mad. Uh, the Democrats obviously were mad at being out of power. The Republicans, some of them felt that they'd been mistreated you know, in 40 years in the wilderness and, and it was payback time. Uh, and you had two uh, rather strong personalities in President Bill Clinton and uh, Speaker Newt Gingrich. They have a lot in common and one of the things that they have in common is that they, uh, they like to be liked. Uh, and so, uh, but it came down to the fact that, that it was our belief at the time that the government was spending too much money and we needed to, to work that out. We eventually did with the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. Uh, but it, it was all, it was all how much are we going to spend. Now, the thing that struck me uh, during this last that's completely different is that every day of that 21-day shutdown in 1995-1996, President Clinton and Newt Gingrich either met in person or they spoke on the telephone. Uh, and they were trying to find, you know, a way out of the mess that, that was created. Nobody thought it was, a, uh, it was a good thing. This time, Nobody was talking to anybody. I think uh, Speaker Boehner's uh, Sunday morning comment was right. Oh, there's a back room, but there's nobody in it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, when you have people on both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue saying, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to go to Oski, uh, it makes it very difficult. And this time was about ideology. You know, if you, if you think about it, th this should have been a pretty good time to be a Republican in Washington. So the budget number was the number that the Republicans wanted in their budget, the, the discretionary spending number, $987 billion, as opposed to over a trillion. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, was running into and continues to run into a number of problems with the, uh, the enrollment process. It was very, very unpopular, uh, and it was beginning to tank in public opinion surveys. So you'd think, well, you know, that things are going our way, so how can we screw it up? How, how we can screw it up? <laughs> How we can screw it up is, is to make the, the one thing that people liked less than the news about the Affordable Care Act was House Republicans. And they did it. And they did it well. And you also, in terms of timing, you're, you're running into the 2014 midterm. And we know historically that the sixth year of an eight-year presidency is a horrible time. Uh, for the president's members of Congress. Usually the president's uh, party gets killed, uh, except for 98, um, in the 98, uh, 98. yeah. yeah sure. and, um, and that was because of the impeachment uh, right. process where Republicans angered people with the impeachment and then, uh, you know, the Democrats ended up actually winning seats. So, um, you know, it should have been really perfect timing in terms of going into this election, especially with the gerrymandered districts. Now we have questions of, you know, uh, are the Republicans uh, going to lose seats? And if, and if they do, are they going to actually potentially lose control? I don't think they will. But, uh, you know, it is possible that they uh, could lose some seats. You know, David, uh, the congressman mentioned how Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton were on the phone with each other every day trying to work something out. I was wondering if you could walk us through the, what you thought the White House strategy was during this shutdown. I mean, o Obama took a very hard line. He didn't, um, you know, he wasn't willing to negotiate in, mm -hmm. on the terms of uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Joe Biden, the Vice President, who's often his secret weapon in some mm -hmm. of these gridlock situations, was MIA. Yeah. What, what was the strategy there? Well, there's a couple of things. You know, first of all, uh, President Obama doesn't have to run for re-election again. So I think that allowed him to essentially take a very hard line. Also, you know, the Republicans were going against his signature piece of legislation. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that's the one thing that he got done in, in his first term that he could hang his hat on. And, uh, I, 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 and I think they made a miscalculation because, you know, the president has capitulated in the past and, and given in. Uh, the fact is he didn't have to worry about re-election. And so he took a very hard line. It turns out to be, it turned out to be a, a very good strategy. Now, the Biden factor, you know, from everything that I've, I've read is um, Harry Reid wanted to freeze uh, the vice president out because um, the Senate uh, Democrats were not happy with some of the, the deals that were brokered in the past, including uh, the sequester deal. So I think, um, 
I, I think it was just a combination of timing with the uh, no re-election incentive and the fact that, you know, the, the president decided to, to hold firm, and I think uh, Republicans were caught off guard by that. Hey, Tamara, let, let's start with you on this next question. What, what happens next with Speaker John Boehner? I mean, what's, what's the future hold for him as Speaker, as Congressman, as a, as a dealmaker in Washington? I think he's actually more secure now in his speakership than he had been, oh, six months ago or so. I think that he 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 didn't want to take this route. Uh, this is was not his his ideal strategy. Uh, he wanted to do a quick show vote on Obamacare, another one like the 45th one, and pass a continuing resolution and maybe try to actually get something done on on deficits and spending issues using using the debt ceiling as leverage. He didn't get to do any of that because uh, the the folks on the far right of his conference wouldn't let him do it that way. Uh, but once he was stuck with the strategy they wanted, he played it all the way to the end. And he he basically followed what the, the hardliners wanted. And the hardliners were the real threat to his speakership, and I'm not even convinced it was ever a real threat. Well, now most of them that I talk to are very supportive of the speaker. Uh, I don't know what he can do, you know, more broadly in terms of relations with the, the White House or with, with Democrats or with the Senate. I don't, I don't know if, if we're actually going to get anything else done in Washington until the 2014 elections, but I think at least for right now, Speaker Boehner is in full control of his conference. Uh, with full control, meaning uh, he can't actually force any of the of the <laughs> Tea Party hardliners to do anything that he wants them to do, but uh, they're not openly rebelling against him right now. I don't know what happens after the 2014 election, and I don't I don't have any great insight into what his plan is or. Or whether he, uh, there, you know, the, a parlor game around here is trying to figure out if he's planning to retire or not, and and I just don't know the answer to that. Well, how about you, how about you, Congressman? You're you're close with the Speaker. Do uh, you have any insight on what he what he plans on doing? I think he's going to run for re-election. Uh, I spoke with him on Sunday just to, uh, you know, when you have a friend that's getting beat up by everybody, you, you sort of want to pick up the phone and say, "Keep your chin up. It's it's going to be okay." Uh, they can't kill you, and and uh, and uh, and he was in pretty good spirits. But he'll he'll run again, and I I think Tamara's right that uh, if you go back about a year, uh, in my opinion, there was a pretty active sort of subcurrent with uh, the majority leader Eric Cantor uh, was sort of sidling up to this Tea Party bunch uh, in an attempt to curry favor and eventually supplant Speaker Boehner. As as things moved forward, uh, I I think. Uh, Majority Leader Cantor recognized that, man, these guys are crazy, and and so <laughs> that his his fortunes were tied to the speakers, mm -hmm. and and if they get rid of Speaker Boehner, they'll get rid of Eric Cantor, they'll get rid of Kevin McCarthy, the whole leadership team will go, and it'll be replaced with a uh, a bunch of new folks, you know. But but this bunch, they they will not be governed. I mean, uh, everything that you would normally do in the old days, people point to earmarks. Well, earmarks are important, but. You know, a lot of times you can just put your arm around somebody if you're a Republican or Democrat and say the team needs you, the country needs you. Can you can you you know throw us a, a bone here and and work with us? These, these guys they don't care. I mean they they really don't care, and there are no pressure points that make them care. And if you look at Tuesday of this week, John Boehner tried not once but twice to save them from themselves by coming up with deals that would have gotten Republicans something, whether it's the medical device tax or it's a, a couple other cats and dogs that they'd thrown in there, and they wouldn't give him the 218 votes to do that. When you, when you do that to your speaker, you deprive him of the power of the majority. And, and there's only, you know, and, and, and at the end of the day, John Boehner made it clear, he, he is not going to default on the nation's obligations, and he hated the shutdown, but he executed every crazy idea that they came up with, I think, in an attempt to show them that they were crazy. Well, they just think they just think they lost this battle. If you watch the interviews afterwards, they we lost the battle, but we're going to win the war. And and so, I mean, there's nothing you can do uh, if some people want to, you know, don tinfoil hats and just charge ahead. Are, are, are there other are there other tools though in his toolbox? I mean, can he remove them from committees? Can he? he I mean, he's a prolific fundraiser. Can he? you know, get uh, candidates uh, to, you know, challenge them in the primary. 
Well, the, the, the second one, not the first one, because he did throw some people off committees yeah. at the very beginning. And what they become is martyrs. You know, when, when Joe Wilson says during the State of the Union address, you lie, which is a horrible, horrible breach of not only decorum, but common sense and everything else, he raises like $3 million on the internet from, from kooky people that, that, think, <laughs> that think that that's okay. And, and likewise, uh, if, when he threw people off the committees, there's a guy from Arizona whose name is escaping me, he became a big rock star on conservative talk radio. Uh, and, and so that's what I mean. And in this day and age, and the parties aren't in control anymore either. You know who controls America when it comes to elections? Super PACs. Super PACs control the elections because on both the left and the right, you have a very small group of very, very rich people who have a disproportionate voice in democracy in this country. And so uh, the, the super PACs prop them up. I mean, on our side, I can't speak about the Democratic side because they never invited me in their meetings, but, but Club for Growth, Heritage Action, uh, Freedom Works, they'll pump millions of dollars into the district. Now, real quickly, on my other job, aside from being at McDonald Hopkins, is I'm the president of the Main Street Partnership. And we are in an active fundraising campaign, and a lot of people are calling us, surprisingly enough. Uh, and we are uh, recruiting uh, people, and, and just one, one district to put in the back of your mind, there's a guy named Justin Amash mm -hmm. up in Michigan who is one of the leaders of these, these uh, folks. And uh, we have a, a real good shot uh, to removing him and replacing him. And we, we just have one litmus test that you, you can't be crazy. We don't have this whole, <laughs> you know, and, and it's Is a it the chucklehead test? No, it's a one oh, question okay. test. We just ask oh. them, do you believe that President Obama was born in the United States? And, and if, if, they, if they answer yes, they're in. <laughs> uh, so just sort of closing out the, this portion of the, of the forum, What's going to happen in January? Are we going to go through all this again? Is the ambassador to Malta not going to be able to come <laughs> to the city club sometime in January? Because we're, we're right back where we started. Uh, curious for your thoughts on, on where, it's, where it's headed next. I think she needs to have a refundable ticket. Let's put it that way. <laughs> all right. Um, I, I don't see anything uh, that has changed the equation here. I think we're going to probably be right back. Um, at it again in a couple of months. I don't, uh, you know, I, I was surprised that there was really no talk about a, a grand bargain. Uh, and I think that, um, unfortunately, um, it's going to be politics as usual, um, really for the next uh, three years. Yeah, I, I, I concur with that. I mean, if you go back, the super committee that we appointed uh, had uh, 12 members, senators and congressmen on it. They couldn't come up with $1.3 trillion in savings over 10 years which led to the sequester in the, the Budget Control Act. Now, I understand there's 22 senators alone on this budget committee, and I, I assume a like number of, of House members. So now you've got 40 instead of 12. That doesn't bode well for you know, a, a resolution, first of all. The differences are broad. And one, one thing that we have not talked about is that, that what drives all of this is, is if you go back and you see the, the nice pictures of uh, Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan and so forth and so on, they didn't agree on much but they trusted each other. They trusted each other to, that if they made a deal, that person was going to stick with the deal. Neither side trusts the other. And the root of that, in my opinion, goes back to uh, their negotiation, the president's negotiation with Boehner in August of 2011 when they tried to put together the big deal. And each felt, each side felt that they were betrayed. And it's very, very difficult. You know, the president's suggestion about open the government, I'll talk to anybody, that's, that's a reasonable position in a world where people trust each other, but it was never going to happen because the House Republicans don't trust the President. We're going to, uh, Tamara, you want to get in a yeah, quick I, thought here on what happens in January? I, I would just say that um, we will probably have to dust off our countdown clocks, but I would guess that they won't get anywhere near as close to zero or 17 days positive as they did this last time. And uh, the only other thing that makes me slightly encouraged is, well, I don't know if encouraged is the right word, but um, I think that there is bipartisan dislike of the sequester, those automatic spending cuts, especially around January 15th, they are going to take a much more significant bite out of defense programs. And that, that may just be enough to force something small that uh, might get them out of um, another CR and might prevent us from having the government shut down. 
And and then the good thing about the uh, the debt ceiling, which expires in February, is that Treasury can continue to use those uh, extraordinary measures that they use this time. So we we might not have a real default threat until summer. <laughs> Uh, we're going to get to audience questions here in, uh, in just a moment. Uh, have another word here from Paul. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring Steve LaTourette, David Cohen, Tamara Keith via Google Hangout, and Henry Gomez as moderator. We'll return to our panelists in a moment for our traditional City Club questions and would ask that you start formulating your questions now. And please try to keep them brief and to the point so we can get a lot of them in. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via broadcast on WVIZ PBS, 90.3 WCPN, and 104.9 WCLV IdeaStream, WTAM as well, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC, and our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Well, November will be another very active month at the City Club, beginning on November 1st when the City Club will welcome Senator Sherrod Brown at our Friday Forum featuring um, lunch uh, and Senator Brown. And we'll also host a special happy hour program at a loft hotel in, uh, that will feature John Campbell, Executive Director of Lakefront Toronto. For more information about the upcoming forums to make a reservation, or to order a CD or DVD of one of our many programs, please refer to our website, and that's www.cityclub.org. We welcome students to today's program. Student participation is made possible by a generous gift from the Charles E. Spar Charitable Trust. Today, we welcome students from Euclid High School, Max Hayes High School, John Adams High School, and the Cleveland School of the Arts. Will our students please stand and be recognized? We, we also welcome guests today at tables hosted by McDonald Hopkins and the Northeast Ohio Media Group. Thank you all for your support. Today is the Cyrus Eaton Memorial Forum made possible by a generous gift from the Cyrus Eaton Foundation. Thank you for your support. And today's program is sponsored by the Northeast Ohio Media Group, the sponsor of politics and policy at the City Club. We thank them for their support. So we have a lot of supporters and we appreciate them all. Now, We'd like to return to our speaker and our, our panelists for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests and uh, our students. Holding the microphone today is City Club Development Manager Mike Cromaldi. There's Mike. And Program Director Carrie Miller. Not sure where she is. <laughs> there she is. First question, please. Today there are pundits on the internet that, that are proposing that at the beginning Harry Reid and Obama wanted the Single Payer Act and they figured that they couldn't get it because it was so unpopular. So they came up with the idea of building the Affordable Care Act in the intention that it should fail. And the propos proposal is that when it fails they can come back and say the only way to save the nation is the Affordable Care, is the uh, National Health Care. You care to care it? Talk about that one. Sounds like a conspiracy theory to me, if I've ever heard one. I, I, I wouldn't give much credence to that, and I would, I would check the source. I mean, I think, uh, you know, in a perfect world, I think uh, many liberals, many progressives, many Democrats, probably including the president, would have loved a single-payer system, single-payer system. Uh, but given the political realities, they knew that they couldn't push it uh, through. Uh, they couldn't even get the government option. Uh, through and so um, you know the Affordable Care Act is, is very much a compromise uh, compromise piece of legislation um, and you know for a lot of Democrats uh, they're not happy uh, with that legislation because it didn't go far enough um, and certainly many Republicans most Republicans are not happy with it because they thought it went too far so I, I think the first half of the, the theory is right that that uh, the president Senator Reed Senator Sherrod Brown is going to be here probably would have uh, been in favor of the single-payer system. But, but I don't think it was, I don't think they then set up the Affordable Care Act to be a failure so that they could somehow backdoor single-payer. The, the Affordable Care Act, the, the, the problem that, that we're facing is the Affordable Care Act that was passed into law was never supposed to be the law. Uh, and, and that's why, uh, just as it's silly 
for someone to stand up for 24 hours and say repeal the whole thing, it is silly to defend all 2,100 pages. Uh, because like a lot of pieces of legislation, there are good pieces and there are bad pieces. And the art of legislating is going back and, and improving, fixing, fixing the bad and improving upon the good. And, and what happened is, you may remember, this, these are my favorite times in Washington during the holiday, the Christmas season. So the president promised we'd have this done by, by Christmas. Uh, and the House was mired with this 2,100-page bill that nobody was reading and so forth and so on, and, and they couldn't lift it out of the House. The Senate produced uh, an Affordable Care Act piece of legislation. And, it, and then, you know, in order to meet that deadline, uh, all these octogenarians over in the, in the Senate, they, they brought in these roll-away beds, and the TV cameras came in, and they wanted you to believe that they were sleeping there, you know, and, and, and as soon as the TV cameras left, they went home to their townhouses in Georgetown and came back the next morning. But, but they, they got it done, they got it done, and they sent it to the House. The bill that passed was the Senate bill, and, and it came over to the House, one hour of debate, no amendments, no discussion, no nothing, passed, but everybody in the room knew that the intention was that we were going to come back the next year and they were going to make adjustments to fix some of the flaws in the bill. Well, a funny thing happened on the way to that. They lost the election in 2010 and, and they never had the opportunity to do that. So the, the way this gets fixed is, is not to have it fail. Uh, the Affordable Care Act needs to succeed, but the Affordable Care Act needs to succeed uh, with improvements that, uh, you know, the, the myth behind it is that we can insure 31 million people and it's not going to cost anybody else any money. I mean, that's nuts. Uh, and, and so th there, there has to be a way to, to fix the flaws and, and enforce the good things, and, and I hope they do that. And, of course, the problem now is that things are so terribly toxic that, that Democrats would be utterly afraid to try to make even small changes to the Affordable Care Act. And, and even if Republicans have good ideas, the Democrats would be too suspicious to go along with them. That's right. Uh, Steve, in the eyes of many, in opinions of many, uh, what we have been experiencing uh, coming out of Washington in the last couple months, particularly the last couple of weeks, demonstrates very clearly what a loss uh, your departure from Congress has created from a point of view of reasonable and responsible discourse and discussion. Thanks. And we had it here at the City Club uh, a couple of weeks ago, Senator, Colin, no, Senator Snow yeah. from, from Maine. Sure. And I posed the question here, which I'd like to post you. Given all we've been going through here, why can't we get, what, for what reason can't we get an, a reasonable number of, a goodly number of conservative, I'm sorry, moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats who can come together and say to both sides, we've got to work this out. They've got to say to the president, you have got to compromise on entitlements. That's the 500 pound, pound elephant okay. that's, going to, that's going to bankrupt us if we don't do something about it. Yep. And to the Tea Party, that it's great to cut the spending and cut the deficit, but you've got to also go after responsible tax reform, which, yes, will mean some increase in revenues. Right. And it uses a basis of that the, the Bowles Simpson Commission sure. uh, report, study, has that as a basis. Why can't we get a, that as a start there and, and see if we can't resolve it that way? Well, I, thank you, Bruce, for the comments. I don't, I'm not sure every voter in my district agrees with your assessment that it was a bad thing that I left. But the, uh, uh, the, the reason is because. I don't know what Senator Snow said, but it's all the things we've been talking about. It, it's redistricting the bright red districts. It's the primary. It's the rise of the super PACs that, that villainize uh, Republicans and Democrats to try and find common ground. It's the fact that the, pow the levers of power in both parties in the Congress are controlled by the uh, the progressives on the Democratic side and the Tea Party on the Republican side, then there's no room for compromise. And I, I will tell you, I put Simpson Bowles on the House floor as an alternative to the Ryan budget uh, two years ago with Jim Cooper, a Democrat from Tennessee. Uh, so we have impassioned debate, 435 votes are at stake. Uh, they call the roll. We got 38 votes out of 435. Uh, and, and so clearly, you know, people talk a good game. People talk about, oh, we're going to work together. But working together, to most people in Washington, means you're working with me if you do everything I want you to do. And that isn't the art of compromise. That isn't getting things done. There's, there's no, and until, until the public demands better, 
you know, uh, you know, and if you look at there was some poll that just came out, 86% of the Americans uh, judge themselves to be in the middle. No, they don't. I mean, I mean, that's a nice answer, but, but we really are a 47, 47 country. And until, you know, you're willing to say uh, that uh, you're right, I got to give up some of my stuff and you got to give up some of your stuff. And, and there's just, there's no appetite there. And, and, and look at the entitlements, for instance, and then I'll really, will shut up. But so, so the, the trustees on, on Social Security say tr Social Security is okay till 2035, and then it can only pay 75% of its. So, so since the life expectancy of a president is eight years, two terms, and the same for a member of Congress, everybody does the math. This is 2013, 2021, Social Security still got 14 years. Why would I want to piss off the AARP and a bunch of seniors in my district? And so you just kick the can down the road. Can I jump in too? I, I, you know, I think I hate to beat a dead horse, but it, I think so much of this goes back again to gerrymandering and the fact that uh, you have a number of moderates uh, that have been, you know, defeated uh, in the last several election cycles. Uh, not only Republicans but Democrats too. You look at the, the the Blue Dog Caucus, which after the 2006 elections numbered somewhere right around 50, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, Jim Cooper is, is, is one of those members. Yeah, uh, they're well under 20. Uh, yeah. They may be in the teens at this point yeah. or, or even single digits. Uh, and so the problem is you don't have uh, as many people in the middle um, where there's much more common ground. And, um, and again, that's a, that's a function of gerrymandering. Um, you know, Democrats were able to overcome that in 2006, I think, um, because it had been a number of years since the last uh, gerrymander. And um, as, as I already said, in the sixth year of an eight-year presidency, the, the opposition party does very well. Democrats did well. Um, but then, uh, you know, those, those, those districts were redrawn. And, um, you know, we, we have very few uh, moderates left, uh, especially on the, on the Democratic side. Yeah. And I, I would just say the war and President George W. Bush were pretty unpopular yep. in 2006 and drove mm -hmm. that election. So. That's distracted mainly at uh, Congressman. Um, you talk about the art of compromise. What do you think of the argument that is actually the art of compromise that got us here, uh, the art of compromise from, specifically from 2000 to 2010 where we compromised on a tax cut not paid for, an entitlement program not paid for, two wars were, that were not paid for. Um, it does kind of hard to imagine how this would end well, and this may be, you know, even rise to the Tea Party and a debt crisis. And I'm not sure how you voted on all those issues, but do you have any regrets on, on, on that? Well, I, you know what, uh, I cast over 12,000 votes, and so I'm sure I screwed up a couple of times. I, I can't uh, uh, point to anyone uh, specific, uh, but, but the way I, just the way I approached my job, I tried to do what most of the people wanted me to do most of the time that sent me to Washington. And, and uh, you know, sometimes that would, would make some people happy and sometimes not. Uh, no, I, I don't think the art of compromise is, is what got us into this, uh, uh, this particular uh, predicament. I, I, my view is that any government, I don't care if it's here in Cuyahoga County or down in Columbus or in Washington, things don't really go well when one side has all the levers of power. And so as Republicans, when we had President Bush, the Senate, and the House, uh, you know, I, President Bush's first veto uh, of legislation that, that we passed was a, a water bill, you know, to put sewers in the ground after seven years. Uh, and that, we completely surrendered our uh, role as a distinct branch of government. Uh, and I would suggest that, you know, it's, it's not any better when the Democrats control all levers of, 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 uh, of, of power. And so, you know, if you look at election results, I, I guess the public likes split government, even though they hate split government. Uh, but if you look at 2012, you know, everybody has a mandate. If you're the president, he was reelected, he has a mandate. But on the other side, if you're the House of Representatives, they reinstalled John Boehner as the Speaker of the House, so they have a mandate. Um, so, but, but you know, there, there's compromise and then there's just, just stupid stuff. I mean, the reason we don't have earmarks anymore is because we had some cardinals on our side, Republican side, that were just pigs at the trough. And, and they were taking hundreds of millions of dollars back to their districts. Uh, and that's how you get the bridge to nowhere in Alaska. And that's how you get some of the, 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 the silly things that get you into trouble. But but I, I'm all for, you know, uh, I, I think the government works, it's designed to work when people talk to each other and, uh, and find a way forward. So no, I don't, I don't regret anything that I did. Thank you, it's such a good panel on a challenging topic. It is hard not to feel 
troubled at the picture you paint of the systemic strain on our democracy. And it is also hard to see things other than redistricting reform aimed at getting more competitive districts, which will change the whole ballgame. Uh, but I ask a question about where the pressures to bring that sort of change about may come from. And I specifically direct your attention back to the international scene, where uh, the, 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 our country is clearly suffering a uh, loss of prestige and ability to provide economic leadership when it has this kind of Mickey Mouse performance. Uh, can you comment at all on whether or not that international pressure is, has any chance of building to the point where we feel troubled and vulnerable enough uh, to begin to have this kind of difficult political change on a state-by-state -state basis? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't. I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't think that our political leaders are particularly concerned about um, the view of, of some of our uh, friends across uh, across the ocean and across our borders. They should be, uh, but I think we're a very uh, insular uh, country, and I think um, uh, I, th I think the pressure has to come from within the country on such things as redistricting. But the problem is, it's such a complicated topic. Uh, I spent a week in, in my American Congress class teaching it, uh, and you know, after five minutes, my students' eyes glaze over, and uh, and I just hope they don't you know hurt themselves as they fall out of the seats <laughs> after they pass out. But it's an incredibly important topic, um, so I think it's got to come from within. I think it'll take education, and I think it'll take uh, awareness. Um, and and I just want to say one thing: uh, Congressman Latourette mentioned people not talking to each other, and. I have never served in Congress, um, but it, for, as an observer, as an outside observer, it appears that people really aren't talking to each other much anymore. Uh, you know, there used to be a lot of uh, whiskey and poker games uh, that used to take place uh, in I the old days. Heard, yeah. That's right. That <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I think uh, Congress looks like it could use a little bit more alcohol and a little bit more, uh, a <laughs> little bit more gambling. I don't know. Maybe you might want to address. Well, that. I, I mean, that, that's that's true. Uh, that uh, I was. Uh, having lunch the other day with a, a freshman uh, Republican from California by the name of Paul Cook at a place called Bullfeathers, which is it's right next to that famous Tortilla Coast where Ted Cruz had that secret meeting the other day. And, and uh, Leonard Lance, another Republican from New Jersey, comes over to say hello to me. And he says, oh, who's your, who's your, who are you having lunch with? It was his colleague, for Christ's sake. And, and, and we are, you know, 10 months into the new Congress. And it's not, it's not unusual that you don't learn every name of everybody in the other party. It is pretty unusual that you don't even know the guys that are on your, uh, on your baseball club and, and, and in your team. And, and so these two-year cycles and the pressure to raise millions of dollars to run for re-election, uh, if, uh, if you were to have been on the, the, the House floor on a Thursday or a Friday afternoon, a getaway day, you see the entire railing, C-SPAN won't show you because it's not so pretty, but the entire back railing is filled with members who want to plunk their card, vote, and then run out the door to a, a car that has a staffer driving them to National so they can get on the first plane and fly back to their districts. It, it really isn't conducive to, to getting to know each other. Uh, and and uh, I, I'm going to tell you that people villainize uh, congressional travel. But one of the reasons I got along so well with so many Democrats is because I had the opportunity with my wife to get on an airplane for 16 hours and fly to Australia with Democrats and their spouses. And we actually got past that, here's a Democrat from, from California. This is, oh, this is Joe, and this is his wife, Mary. They have three kids, and they're interested in the same things that I am. And, and that doesn't happen very often. This question is to uh, Congressman Steve LaTourette. Uh, Congressman, for many years uh, you served with distinction in the House of Representatives, and you certainly were the uh, uh, prime example of how a person can be uh, a mediator, can be a, uh, work out things on both sides of the aisle. As a Republican, you led a very important role in that. But you're retired, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You're no longer there. Mm -hmm. And at the, at, the, at the current time, there are several other very prominent Republicans who are moderate who are retired. Right. I'm thinking of the uh, Olympia Snow, former senator from Maine. Uh, I'm thinking of the senator from New, New Jersey. Uh, uh, just can't think of his name right now. Luger. 
and also the former right. senator from uh, New York State. Right. And my question is, now that those moderating voices are gone, and uh, the uh, Tea Party uh, has uh, amassed a significant uh, role in the House of Representatives, uh, where does the Tea Party stop and the Republican Party, been, Re Republican Party, party begin? Yeah. Has the Tea Party morphed into the Republican Party, or is there an independent Republican Party today apart from the Tea Party? You know, that, that, that's a great question. And I will tell you that it is at the center of, there's currently a fight for the soul of the Republican Party uh, going on nationally. Uh, and I think that uh, Senator Cruz and his allies would very much like to be the Republican Party. But I, you know, until I draw my last breath, <laughs> they will not be the Republican Party. And, and so here's, here's the distinction. Here's what motivates this two, these two groups of people. They believe, and, and, and this is not, they're not being dishonest about it, they really believe in their heads that if the Republican Party veered further to the right and was more extreme and more conservative, we would have beaten Barack Obama in 2012. And they point to the fact, and they will tell you with a straight face, that three million uh, conservative voters who voted for John McCain didn't turn out to vote for Mitt Romney. And so the failure is the evangelicals and others uh, who they rely on as their base vote didn't turn out. And so they want to take the party in a rightward tilt further to the right. Now, from my perch and the people that I'm working with at the Republican Main Street to, to elect uh, not crazy people, um, we believe, and, and we believe what, what the chairman of the National Republican Party said after the 2012 election. It's very difficult for me to get my head around, and I, I stood elections, you know, for over 24 years, and I retired undefeated and unindicted, and I'm very happy about that. <laughs> but but you, you, I, I don't see how you can win a national election. You, you can win the House of Representatives because you've got a lot of red seats below the Mason-Dixon line. But if we alienate women, uh, how are we going to win elections? If we can't attract African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, gay Americans, people in the labor movement, I mean, I, how, you know, I don't think there's enough 55-year-old angry white guys out there to beat that kind of coalition. Uh, and so the fight that's now going on are those two visions. Uh, and and I, you know, I'm, I'm going to fight the fight. A lot of my friends are going to fight the fight. And, and, uh, and, and if you're a Democrat, you should fight the fight. You know, there, there are some, some very partisan Democrats who love this destruction of the Republican Party. It's really not good for the country. The, 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 the country really thrives when you have two strong political parties and you have a debate of ideas. Uh, and at the moment, uh, we're a little short on one side. Um, one of you guys up there quoted something about um, Obama kept avoiding or ignoring or not wanting to get involved with anybody in the House or anybody that was, you know, why the government shut down ended the way how it did. But in my opinion, Obama has, like every plan that he's came up with, people have ignored it, Republicans have ignored it a lot. But if he did voice out and if he did talk to everybody and worked with Republicans, Democrats, House and Senate, House Representatives, all those people. How do you think, do you think the government shutdown would have went down the way it did? Or do you think it would have went differently? And what result do you think would have came upon that? Uh, before you answer, I just want to thank Tamara Keith for joining us. Uh, she, had to, she had to run busy times uh, in Washington. Uh, I, I think uh, <laughs> I think President Obama, uh, like Congressman Latourette said, felt burned uh, from two years ago when they negotiated uh, in 2011. They both felt, uh, the Speaker of the House and the President both felt they had a deal, it fell apart, uh, and they pointed fingers at each other. And I think uh, it's a common theme. It all goes back to getting to know one another. And I think in, if in that two-year period um, the President would have, uh, and the speaker would have gotten together uh, on a personal basis and talked, played more golf, um, you know, smoked a cigarette together, uh, something like that, uh, shared a glass of wine or a beer. I think um, 
I, I think we could have avoided this uh, because they would have built up a relationship and gotten to know each other better. And I think they do actually like each other personally. Um, but I, I just don't <laughs> think that they know each other. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> just saying. Yes. <laughs> and, and Tamara Keith is back. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, j jump right. Feel free to jump right in. Um, I don't know how much of us of, of the program you've been able to hear the last few minutes, but uh, we're getting close to the end. Any any parting thoughts from you on where? Oh, um, oh gosh. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I I will say, and this is probably a topic ago, but uh, there, the weekend before the shutdown, a bunch of members were stuck in Washington, and. So, and they never stay in Washington, uh, in part because going Washington has become such a bad thing uh, because you don't, if, you, if you go Washington, then you're, you're not real anymore. Uh, and so these members, for the first time in a long time, were actually in Washington, and a bipartisan group of, of young uh, representatives went on a hike and, and did some tourist things together, and, and now there's some discussion that, that they might um, be trying to form a coalition of people who actually want to get things done. Um, so th some of that, that social stuff uh, could go a long way. I, I think you left out of the story that some of the Republicans pushed some of the Democrats off the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> not, this, not this time. I Actually, I think that in this last crisis, um, Republicans were doing a very good job of pushing each other off of them. That's exactly right. <laughs> All right, well, we are coming to a conclusion here. I want to thank everybody on the panel for participating today and great questions from the audience. Today at the City Club of Cleveland we have been listening to a Friday Forum featuring Steve LaTourette, David Cohen, Tamara Keith and Henry Gomez as moderator. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.